Rob told me to run up here, so that's what I did. Um, now I'm out of breath, so give me a second. Uh, man, I'm, I'm so excited to share with you all this morning. Um, normally, I'm just the guy that's sitting out there uh, listening uh, to the messages, but this morning I get to share with you. And uh, can you tell that God's doing some amazing things at Foundation Church? He really is. And what's awesome about that is... Um, it, if he's doing great things at Foundation Church, that means he's doing great things in the individual lives of this church because we are the church. And so, um, anyway, uh, turn in your Bibles, if you would, this morning to Psalm 84. That's where we're going to be this morning, Psalm 84. The Westminster Catechism begins with this question. What is the chief end of man? Another way to state this would be, what is the primary purpose for a person's life? The Catechism goes on to answer that question by saying, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So there are two parts to that. Glorifying God and enjoying God. It seems to me that as Christians, we tend to spend a lot more time on the first part, trying to glorify God, than we do on the second part, enjoying Him For many, I'm not sure that that's even a category in their life or that they even know what that means to enjoy God. Did you know the Bible has a lot to say about our enjoyment of God and the joy that we have in Him? I immediately think of King David who in Psalm 1611 said, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Or the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.4 where he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Or Psalm 37.4 which simply says, Delight yourself in the Lord. All throughout the scriptures we are commanded to not just enjoy God's gifts, but to enjoy God himself. So this leads to an important question. Is God our true and ultimate source of joy? Or we could ask it another way. We could say, do we long for God to draw near to Him? Do we yearn for Him and desire Him? We definitely should have it as our aim to glorify God, but not to the exclusion of enjoying Him. It's easy, I think, to get caught up in the routine of life, even the routine of serving, following God and following Jesus, that we forget our joy. So I would ask you this morning, how would you rate your level of joy in God How much do you long for God? One way we can measure our joy in something is by how much we long for it. We all long for things in our lives, don't we? Maybe for you, it's your favorite meal. For me, that would be steak and taters. That's just, you you can kind of tell. Or maybe ice cream. When there's something we enjoy, we long for it. Maybe it's a place. For Lori and I, we bought a a travel trailer a couple years ago, and we discovered Robbers Cave State Park down in southeast Oklahoma, and we love that place. We long for it. We've been there eight times in the last couple years. We love the smell of the pine. We love just God's beauty in in nature there. We, We long to be in that place. Maybe it's a person or a vacation to the beach or to the mountains. Maybe it's for you. Maybe it's a hobby, like playing golf or hunting. How deeply do we long for God? How much joy do we find in Him and the experience of Him? John Piper's version of the Catechism is this God is most satisfied in us. I'm sorry, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. So, how satisfied are you in God? With those thoughts, we turn to Psalm 84. Charles Spurgeon, uh, he was known as the Prince of Preachers, he called this psalm the pearl of all psalms and one of the most sweet of all the psalms. It's really the testimony of a man who longs to be in the presence of God. He knows the joy available in God and he wants more. When When we read this psalm, we really need to look at it in the Old Covenant, Old Testament context that it was written in. This man longs to be in the temple God told his people to build a tabernacle, a physical place where the presence of God would dwell. And in that temple was the Holy of Holies, a place behind the veil or the curtain where only the high priest could enter. 
And at that, he could only enter once a year. Very different from our experience of God today, from how we approach God today. Back then, many of the people of God had to travel long distances to be in the presence of God, to be near him. It's clear in the psalm, in Psalm 84, the writer is longing to be there. He's longing more for a person than he is a place. It's a longing for presence, longing to be near to God. So as we walk through this wonderful psalm psalm this morning, ask yourself this question. Do I truly believe there is joy in the presence of God? And do I long for it as much as the writer of this psalm did? So I want to start in Psalm 84, and I'm going, to, I'm going to look at verses 1 through 4 first. Let me read that to you. Psalm 84, verse 1. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are praising you forever. Here we see the words of a man who deep in his soul wanted to be in the presence of the Lord, wanted to be in the presence of Yahweh. When he says the courts of the Lord, he really isn't talking so much about a place as he is a person. He is longing to be with God, to be in his presence. He speaks of his heart and his flesh singing for joy when he is in the presence of God. We see similar expressions in other psalms like Psalm 42, 1 and 2, which says, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs for you, O God. This is a deep longing in the soul to be near to God. Where does this longing come from? Why does he have it? It comes from God himself. He designed us that way. All of us, even today, he designed us that way on purpose. In verse 3, he starts talking about birds, which might seem kind of weird at first glance. But this verse makes me smile when I read it. There's a picture I have uh, that will come up here. And it's every, it's, this is looking out uh, my office window upstairs at my house. As I was writing this message, I, I took that picture. Every year in the spring, the swallows come and they make their home under the eaves of our front porch. And they make a huge mess. You can all relate to that, right? But they love to be there under the safety and security of the structure of our home, out of the storms, away from the predators, safe and secure and happy, right in the midst of our presence. The writer of the psalm says, what I would give to be like one of these swallows who was able to make their home under the eve of the temple, to be constantly in the presence of of the Almighty, You've heard the old saying, home is where the heart is. For the psalmist, his heart was in the presence of the Lord. And then in verse 4, this is the first of three times in this psalm that the writer uses the phrase, blessed are those, because it is indeed the greatest blessing in all of life to be in his presence. And our response when we're in his presence should be praise and worship. The first point in your handout, if you're following along and taking notes, the first point is this. We should desire the presence of the Lord. Verses 5 through 7. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. One of the greatest sentences in all of God's word to me personally. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. Here it is again in verse 5. He says, how blessed is the man. I love the picture that the writer paints here of the difficult journey many of the pilgrims faced at that time and what they had to endure to make it to the temple in Jerusalem. It's a picture of of a hard, dry journey and not an easy one. The Valley of Baca translates literally valley of weeping. This may or may not have been an actual literal place, but the point is this. Pilgrimages to the temple and to the tabernacle were a great feature of Jewish life. And many of these people had to go through some very hard stuff, some suffering to make this journey. The writer of the psalm, 
the writer says the man whose heart longs to be in the presence of the Lord doesn't just barely make it or arrive worn out and bitter and angry and frustrated by the challenges of the journey. They arrive at their destination, the temple, blessed and strong and happy and fulfilled. They have gone from strength to strength, not from weakness to weakness, not from failure to failure, not from misery to misery, from strength to strength. How could they do this? Because their strength was in the Lord. Because in their hearts, they had such a longing and strong desire to be with their Lord that all the challenges and problems and frustrations seemed trivial compared to the joy of being in his presence. This can also be a picture of the journey of our lives. Is that how you go through your journey? Is that a picture of your life? Do you go from strength to strength? Are you growing stronger spiritually as perhaps you're growing weaker physically? I know people who are, and I'm learning to live that way. Charles Spurgeon, who, by the way, dealt with depression, struggled with depression all of his life, said this about this text. There are joys of pilgrimage which make men forget the discomforts of the road. There's a big difference in the heart of the pilgrim who makes it. He makes the journey out of duty and the one who journeys out of love and longing for his Lord. It is possible to not just glorify God, but to enjoy him now and forever and to enjoy the journey. But only if the longing of your soul and your greatest desire in your life is to be in the presence of your king every moment of your day. This is the person the psalmist says is truly blessed. So the second point in your handout is this. We should journey in the presence of the Lord. We should journey in the presence of the Lord. And then we get to verses 8 through 10. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. And look upon the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Here in verses 8 and 9, the psalmist is is actually lifting up a prayer to Yahweh when he prays for God to look upon the face of your anointed. Who Who was he talking about? It's a prayer. Here we have the nation of Israel's prayer for their king, most likely King David. For us today as believers, this would be our prayer to the son of David, Jesus himself. For the kings of Israel were were anointed by God to serve and protect his people and the temple itself. Praise God, today we don't look to a king or a governor or a president for protection. We look to the king of kings, to the Lord Jesus for protection. America, or any leader in it, is not our hope or the hope of the world, Jesus Christ is. Let's keep that in mind as we head towards November. It really is true. And then we come to verse 10 where the psalmist says that the best the kingdom of this world has to offer pales in comparison to what the kingdom of God can provide. He says, one day living in the presence of God is better than a thousand days in the pleasures of the world. The older I get and the more I apprentice myself to Jesus, the the more real this becomes to me. I think it's why Paul could make the statement, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Spurgeon said this about this verse. He said, to feel God's love, to rejoice in the person of Jesus, to survey the promises and feel the power of the Holy Spirit in applying precious truths to our soul is a joy which worldlings cannot understand but which true believers are ravished with. The psalmist is saying this to his God. One day spent in your house and in your presence beats thousands spent on Greek island beaches. I'd rather scrub floors in the house of my God than be honored as a guest in the palace of sin. I believe, honestly, this is the greatest battle of the Christian faith. The greatest battle of our life is fighting against longing for the pleasures of the world more than the pleasures of choosing life in Jesus. The more we hold on to the world and all it offers, the less we experience and enjoy the pleasures of union with our Lord. This is what C.S. Lewis was speaking about 
when he said this. He said, many of us are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. And then he says, we are far too easily pleased. The third point in your handout is we find true and lasting pleasure in the presence of the Lord. And then we come to verses 11 and 12. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. This is the only place in all of scripture that God is referred to as a sun. S-U-N. We pilgrims need both, don't we? We need a sun for happy days, and we need a shield for dangerous ones. A sun above us and a shield around us. For us, God is a light to show the way and a shield to protect us on the way. The psalmist says, blessed are those who journey through life with such a convoy as this. Just as life on earth for human beings would be impossible without the sun, so is true everlasting life not possible without God. He goes on to say, the Lord will give grace and glory. Both of those things he will give in due time as needed, both to the full and both with absolute certainty. The Lord has both of these things in full abundance. Jesus is the fullness of both. And when we place our faith and trust in him and we choose to follow him and learn from him and do what he did, we receive both as a free gift from God himself. And then he says this, pretty amazing statement. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. What a promise. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? I'm afraid it's probably taken out of context quite a little bit. But notice it doesn't say no good thing does he withhold from those who just believe. If you've been following the daily Bible reading with us in Mark, you know that even the demons believed in Jesus. This says no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. This is a promise made to those who walk uprightly. The nature of this promise is appropriate under the old covenant where God promised direct blessings for obedience. And he promised curses for disobedience. Under the new covenant that we live in today, the believer receives God's good things on the basis of God's, on the basis of Jesus' goodness, not our own. And then out of love for him, we go on to walk uprightly. The text does not say, I will force all my children to enjoy the good thing. It says, No good thing will he withhold. I believe this is true. There are thousands and thousands of mercies and good things that we do not enjoy, not because they are withheld from us, but because we do not take them. So how can we know what it means to walk uprightly? Paul taught in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 that we should be careful how we walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of our time. Jesus, at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, said this. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his life upon the rock. To walk uprightly is to do what Jesus teaches, not just to read it or hear it, but to put these things into action in our life. And when we do, we are wise, and it unlocks the blessings of God in our lives, and he promises he will not withhold them. And verse 12, here's the third time in these 12 verses that the psalmist says, blessed is the man. This word blessed is actually translated from the Greek word makario, which means to be fully satisfied and receive God's favor, regardless of the circumstances. I like to think about it like this. I like to think about blessing like this. When we do what our rabbi Jesus teaches us to do, things just seem to work out for our best. It's a great definition of blessing. The fourth point in your handout is this. We enjoy provision in the presence of the Lord. I hope you see that the man in this psalm, in the context of the old covenant, had a burning desire and longing to be in the temple, more specifically, to be in the presence of God. But how does this apply to us today 
who no longer live under the old covenant. Here's the point for us today. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, we no longer need to make the pilgrimage to a temple. The moment Jesus died on the cross, the veil to the Holy of Holies was torn in half by God himself. From that moment on, as born-again believers, we have access to his presence anywhere and anytime because his spirit lives inside us. Church, we are the temple. And God now lives in us as believers. What a precious truth that is. But just like the man in the psalm, we should have the same longing and desire for God's manifest presence in our lives. So I want to spend the rest of my time on the practical application of this. I need a little help from my wife and from my friend Sean, if you guys would come up here. I want to give you an illustration this morning. Most likely, the majority of you that are listening to this have at least some desire for God in your life and for Jesus. But how do we increase our desire for Jesus? How do we actually experience life in Jesus on a daily basis? My real aim is to challenge you to think about this and to give you something practical to help you with this. So I want to use this illustration to show you how you can actually increase your longing and desire for God. So suppose, and welcome my lovely (laughs) wife and my good friend, Sean. Love you guys. Uh, Suppose I wanted to increase my desire and my longing for my wife. How would I do that? I would turn my eyes towards her. I would make, if I look at her, I'm going to cry. I would make her and her alone the focus of my desires. I would not be looking lustfully at other women. I would not flirt with other women, not even a little bit. I would guard my eyes and I would guard my heart. I would cut out anything in my life that was taking desire from my wife. Relationships, hobbies, pornography, social media, the internet, anything that was causing me to desire someone or something else more than her. I would turn my ears towards her. I would listen to her. I would be present with her. I would communicate with her more and more. I would ask her questions. I would seek her input in my life. I would tell her my deepest fears, my dreams, my thoughts, my cares. I would, turn my eye, I would turn my mind and my thoughts towards her. I would think about her constantly and stay in contact with her throughout my day. I would call her, text her, check in with her. And I would pray with her every day. I would turn my affections towards her. I would steady her, get to know her more. I would praise her and compliment her. I would be intentional about spending time with her. And I would include her in every single aspect of my life. If I wanted to increase my desire and longing for my wife, I would sum it up this way. I would pursue her and I would treasure her. I would pay attention to her. Because what we pay attention to shows where our heart is. Obviously, this isn't a sermon about marriage, although I think that was pretty good, uh, actually. (laughs) I might go on the road with that. I don't know. (laughs) So what's the point? Sean, you're probably wondering why Sean is standing up here, right? (laughs) This is kind of weird, isn't it, like talking about marriage? My buddy Sean is up here. I want you to use your imagination this morning. I want you to pretend that Sean is Jesus himself. And it's not a stretch, right? Because he looks like Jesus. <laughs> That's why I chose him. I didn't go after Jonathan Rumi or Mel Gibson. I wanted Sean. <laughs> but just pretend, let's not make this awkward or weird, but let's just pretend that this is Jesus Christ standing right next to me. And suppose that I wanted to increase my desire and my longing for Jesus. How would I do that? I would make him and him alone the focus of my life. I would turn my eyes towards him. I would not look lustfully at the world and all it offers. I would not flirt with the world. I wouldn't get my feet just as close to the line of sinfulness as I could without going over. 
I would guard my eyes and my heart. I would cut out anything in my life that was taking desire from Jesus. Anything that was causing me to desire something else over him. I would turn my ears towards him. I would listen to him. I would be present with him. I would communicate with him more and more. I would ask him questions. I would seek his input in my life. I would tell him my deepest fears, my dreams, my thoughts, my cares. I would turn my mind and my thoughts towards him. I would think about him and stay in contact with him throughout my day. I would develop a conversational prayer life with him. I would turn my affections towards him. I would steady him, get to know him more and more. I would praise him and worship him. I would be intentional about spending time with him. I would include him in every single aspect of my life. My life would revolve around him. If I wanted to increase my desire and longing for Jesus, I would sum it up this way. I would pay attention to him. Because what I pay attention to shows where my heart is. I would pursue him and I would treasure him. This is in your notes. It's worth writing down. If Jesus is your treasure, he will be your pleasure. If Jesus is your treasure, he will be your pleasure. Isn't it remarkable that these lists of habits or practices are so similar? I believe that is by design. I think that's God's design. Both are real persons. Both are relationships. It's not by accident that we are called in Scripture the bride of Christ. It's by God's design that the marriage relationship, when done according to God's design, parallels in many ways our relationship with Jesus. Just like it's a choice to love and pursue and treasure my wife, it's a choice I make to love and pursue and treasure Jesus. Thank you guys for helping me. Now I realize this illustration is not perfect. I know that. Some of you would say, I'm not married. So think in terms of a friend, a best friend. Or some of you might say, my spouse would not respond to my attempts to desire them more. I understand that too. We know that human beings will always let us down. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus never will. He never will. He will always respond to our efforts to desire him more and grow closer to him. Listen to the words of Jesus himself when he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Jesus isn't saying, ask me for a new car. Or for a fat bank account or any material possession. Jesus is saying, if you ask for more of me, I'll give it to you. If you seek me, I won't hide from you or run from you or ignore you. If you knock on my door, I will always answer and invite you in. Jesus will do that for you. He always will. I want to close with this. Earlier I mentioned that what we pay attention to shows what we value and what we love. Here's a truth I want to share with you. If you don't remember anything I said today, remember this. What we pay attention to, we begin to adore. What we adore, we begin to have affection and love and longing for. What we love and long for transforms our lives. This is a principle that applies to many areas of our lives. If we pay attention to the wrong things, or destructive things, they will transform our lives as well, but not for the better. We can even pay attention to good things that we put above giving our attention to Jesus and it becomes a bad thing. Someone once said, tell me what you pay attention to and I will tell you who you are. This holds true in our relationships. Attention is the basic food and water of a living and breathing relationship. Attention is how we nurture and feed. 
Attention is what we need and crave. Without attention, no relationship can prosper. Our attention is the number one barometer for our lives. It is the proof point for where we actually place our priorities. At any given time, we turn our attention to the thing we perceive that matters the most. And distractions of all kinds compete for our attention all the time. A.W. Tozer said this about attention. He said, God is here. The whole universe is alive with his life, and he is no strange or foreign God, but the familiar father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, whose love for these thousands of years enfolded the sinful race of men. And then he said this, and always he is trying to get our attention. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is always trying to get your attention? And to reveal himself to us, to communicate with us, we have within us the ability to know him if we will but respond to him. And this we call pursuing God. God made a move toward us by sending his son to be our guide, to be our way, to be our life. We have to make a move back to him and away from the idols that distract us and divert us from him. We must consciously come into his presence by intentionally choosing to pay attention to him. When we do, he will see us. He will hear us. He will listen to our prayers. We get to choose. Whom will we choose? Maybe some of you this morning are, are thinking, come on, Mike, that's all just church talk. That stuff is just for the pastors, and spiritually elite, or maybe the monks. Those type of people, that's not for me. It's not for regular people like me. Here's what I would say to that. I'm not a pastor. I'm certainly not spiritually elite. Praise God, I'm not a monk. Just a regular guy. But hear me when I say this. I've been married for 30, almost 36 years. In those... 36 years, I was not always the husband I described to you in the illustration. But several years ago, I decided that I was going to be that husband that desired and longed for his wife. And I started putting into practice those things that I shared with you. And believe me, I don't do them perfectly. Lori will attest to that. I don't do them perfectly. But that is my aim. And I can tell you I've done it both ways. And I believe 100% by, that by choosing this way, it brings glory and honor to my wife. And I enjoy her more than I ever had in our 36 years of marriage. I've also been a Christian for 51 years, praise God. Honestly, in most of those 51 years, I was not the follower of Jesus that I described in the illustration. But back in 2017, I decided I wanted to long for Jesus and desire him above anything or anyone else in my life, including my wife. And I've been on that journey ever since. So again, I can tell you I've done it both ways. And I can testify that by choosing this way, it brings glory and honor to Jesus, and I enjoy him more than I ever have. And that enjoyment keeps growing. Jesus is a well that will never run dry. The more we taste the pleasures of following him and being with him, the more we will want of him. I listened to a podcast recently about why some believers think that experiencing the presence of God and specifically life in Jesus is only for certain special saints. And how many people today believe that perhaps God plays favorites and only really blesses some people with the desire to pursue him. And then he said this, God is present to these people not because he loves them more than us or he pays more attention to them than he does to us, but because they loved him more and they pay more attention to him than we do. Deciding to pay attention to Jesus, the one who loves you so much that he laid down his life for you, will reap a harvest in your life that you cannot imagine is possible. And it's available to anyone. If you would bow your heads, close your eyes.
Perhaps there are some of you listening to this message who have absolutely no desire whatsoever for God or for Jesus in your life. There is no longing at all for the things of God in your life. If that is you, I would say this. There is a God-sized hole in your heart that only Jesus can fill. You need to give your life to Jesus. I invite you to come speak with one of our staff, pastor, elders that are going to be up here this morning. They will be up here. They're up here right now. Just come and, come and pray with them. Come and talk to them. They will show you that path of giving your life to Jesus. If you're listening to this and you do have some desire and longing for Jesus, but, you're sent, but you sense the, the life that you're experiencing is only a fraction of what it could be. Here's what I want to invite you to this coming week. I put this in your handout, but I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you here. I just want to give you five things. I want you to think about this week. The first thing is seek. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you increase your desire for Jesus. More desire begins with a decision that you want that in your life. So go to the source and ask for it. The second thing I would say is pray. Just give Jesus your attention. Just talk to him. Be with him. Invite him into your day. The third thing is worship. Worship personally, alone, and corporately. Nothing increases your desire for Jesus more than worship. Fourth thing, share Jesus with others. What's he doing in your life? What are you learning? How are you growing? What is he showing you? The fifth thing is read. The daily Bible reading. We're in the Gospels. We're in Mark. About to go into Luke. You'll learn how much Jesus loves you, how much compassion and love he has, and that will make you love him more. I encourage you to think about this week, what are you paying attention to? 